Hello and welcome to the Men's Corner Podcast. I'm your host, George Stumanoff. Welcome. Today, I'm sitting down with my friend Keith, and um, we'll be talking about a book. We talk about the book written by Tony Parsons called Man and Boy. How are you, Keith? I'm really well, thank you. Nice to be sitting here with you. Did you like reading Man and Boy? Yeah. Yeah, it's a very um, easy read, very relaxed read. Um, And this is the second time I've read it. But um, this time I read it with a view to looking at what he's saying about um, him as a father and him as a son. Whereas the first time I read it, I just read it as a novel. How long ago was that when you first read it? Um, Probably 15 years or something. Mm. I read this book probably the same time as you did. I was 17 (laughs) back in Bulgaria. There was this girlfriend of mine, uh, my first girlfriend actually, sort of serious and she lent me the book translated in Bulgarian and I read it even then wow I'm surprised yes yeah even then I was really struck by it I was impacted because of the way he writes and the rawness and the reality of his experience and I was so surprised to see this book like years later when I moved to England Um, I think I saw it in a charity shop I bought it for a pound or something yeah yeah what do you think um, made your girlfriend give it to you had she read it? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think because she was like myself into books. So we always sort of gave books oh, to one another. Oh, you just shared what yeah. you were reading. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, that was interesting. So have you read it in English now? Oh, yeah. Three, and, three times. And has the impact <clears throat> been different to reading it in your own language? Well, definitely. But I'm not sure if it was because it's in English or because of the place where I'm now, you know, oh. doing the men's work and having done so much work into my own masculinity, my own men's nature. So I don't know why the difference is so big, but it's huge. Yeah. It's huge. I just see so much in that book. That's why that's why we're here. Yes. So, Keith, do you want to walk us through the book in one minute? <laughs> what is it about? Yes. Well, it's about... Um, the writer's experience being a son and being a husband and being a father, how he struggled with all of those roles. Mm. That might be a good mm. description. It's, it's fiction, but it's based on his life. Yes. Largely. Right, yeah, it's about Harry Silver, that's his name. And he's, um, he basically has a wonderful marriage, they've got a child. His wife's name is Gina. They've got, a, they've got a little boy named Pat. But Harry's looking for something that he doesn't feel he has in life. And don't we all sometimes? So he just, he, he blows it all away. He cheats on his wife and she finds out and everything just changes for him dramatically. So I want to just jump straight to page six. Because we're not going to be looking at Harry Silver as a person or his practicality of life and how he relates to his child or his wife. But we'll be looking specifically for masculinity and where he's at in terms of his own masculinity. So page six is um, Harry's birthday. And for some reason, he stops to look at a sports car, which doesn't make sense. You know, he's a family man. He shouldn't be buying a sports car. But he's looking at it. There's something appealing. So he says this, the car smelled like somebody else's life, like freedom. It was parked right in the window of the showroom. Naturally, it was red, a flaming testosterone stuffed red. When I was a little bit younger, such blatant macho corn would have made me sneer or snigger or puke or all of the above. Now I found that it didn't bother me at all. In fact, (laughs) It seemed to be just what I was looking for at this stage of my life. Amidst the perfume of leather, rubber and all those yards of freshly sprayed steel, you could smell a heartbreaking newness. A newness so shocking that it almost overwhelmed me. This newness intimated another world that was limitless and free, an open road leading to all the unruined days of the future. Somewhere, they had never heard of traffic cones or physical decay, or my 30th birthday. Hmm. 
I find this hilarious that it's all on his 30th birthday. He's just a child. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. How can 30 be such a milestone? Mm. Anyway, it obviously was for him. Mm. Well, is that typical, do you think? Do men feel they've missed out on something in life when they hit 30? I was feeling this way when I was in my 20s. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, when you're younger, when you're in your teens, um, you still have hopes to live certain life in your 30s or in, in your strength. Uh, the saddest thing about this world is that we divide life. When you're younger, that's your best years. When you're older, that's absolute rubbish. But that's how modern world is. Like some cultures are not this way. All the cultures, the older you get, the richer you get in every way. So <laughs> I remember in my 20s, and I had a good life from that point of view in terms of it was full of pleasure you know in my student years but eventually you know i'll go out one night and second night and search for something and search for that that experience but there would be times when i'll just run out of money and get on my balcony and look towards the seafront back home in, in in a city called varna and in the summer all the summer nightclubs will open up and you see the lights shooting up in the sky you know and you hear the music and people having fun and tourists and, and just the whole life was happening somewhere else. Me, I didn't have money to go out. So that night, hope was cut off for me. I'm thinking, life is running out. Mm. It's just running out. I'm, I'm here now, stuck in this flat. I don't want to be here. I want to be out there living. And life is just slipping away. Every day is, is going by again. And that's pretty sad. So... I can only imagine how Harry must have felt when he already had a wife and a child. And for many of us who have looked for life somewhere else and thinking, oh yeah, I want more, more of life, then you might have the best wife, the best child, because obviously you're looking for something that can't be found there. It will be missing. So that's why I think Harry is he, he's desiring these things that he thinks is not there because he's not there. Do, do you think there's anything about... Um taking responsibility for your choices in this because you sitting in that flat as a student was a result of you choosing to do that. Harry, um, he's chosen to marry this person, they've chosen to have a child and yet something you and he came to a point, you saw something else and you thought, oh, my choices up till now mean I can't have that. So at what point should a man just be responsible for facing up to the choices that he's made rather than opting out for something else? Mm, man, what a good question. The problem with people like myself and Harry Silver is that we're not rooted in the masculinity of our father. Our fathers should have given us a deep rootedness this deep sense of joy, you belong to your tribe, to your family, you belong to the world, ultimately. So you mean you're always looking for that? Yes. And it might be in a red car, or mm. it might be the lights of a nightclub. Yeah. And you might we... find that thing which you don't have. Mm. Exactly. So what happens when you have the red car and then you crash it, or you go to the nightclub and you get drunk and you feel sick, Yeah. and it doesn't meet that need, what do you do then? Well, for me, for about a decade, I just kept looking somewhere else. Oh. There was another girl. There was another nightclub. There was cocaine. There was this. There was that. You're trying to fill a gap that is not in your practical life. It's not in your surroundings. It's not in your experiences. It's inside of you. But you think it's in your surroundings. It, of course. Yeah. You think it's external. If I only had more money, if I only had more cocaine, if I only had more pleasure, it's not that. Me and Harry Silver, we both didn't grow up. Because when a boy doesn't get what a boy needs in childhood or is traumatized by his distant father. He might be the greatest father. Like in my case, I worship my father. But he was distant, he was cold, and there was this harshness that I couldn't get close to him. So part of me got stuck back in time and I, I was always a boy in a man's body. So when a boy doesn't get what he needs, he can't move on. He can't take responsibility. It will be false. It will break him eventually because part of you is missing. Part of you can't handle life. And that's, that's actually very, very true. It's the reality. It's not to blame Harry Silver or myself, but there are ways to move move on or move in to yourself and try and fix that thing. So now if we move to page number 10. When will I feel, Harry Silver said, 
When would I feel the way I felt the night my wife said that she would marry me? When would I feel the way I felt the morning my son was born? When would life be that, I don't know, real again? When? Wow. There you go, looking for that feeling, for that buzz. And it's nothing wrong to look for that transcendence because our deepest nature is transcendent. There is ep every moment is epic, if you know that. There's, there's so many battles to fight and challenges to overcome. But first, you need to be yourself. You need to be whole inside. Only then will you see life as, as exciting. Only then every daily moment will be a challenge in the way, I, for example, me now, the way I father my kids, the way I do this and that, the way mm, things between me and my wife. Nothing is mundane about that. Nothing is boring. But now I'm in the battle. I'm in the, I'm whole now. I've, I've gone through, as you know, you've supported me in this long journey of darkness and restoration and, and finding parts of myself again and finding that true masculinity so that I can live from a full heart. I don't need now to take cocaine. Life is exciting enough. But you, know? you have a natural high. Yes, yeah. Sometimes when I so, don't want it. <laughs> so how, how do you move from always seeking that feeling, like Harry Silver said, when am I going to feel like that again? It, it sounds as though he's chasing a feeling. And feelings are transitory, aren't they? Is it all about chasing a feeling? Or is there... Is there a deeper reality than just looking for a buzz? Mm, much deeper reality. So yeah. how do you move from chasing the feeling and believing that that feeling is reality to finding something deeper? It's through the inner work. You know, from what we've seen you know, in our involvement together and you know, all other men. Do you want to explain a little bit what you mean by inner work? Inner work of healing restoration going back into your own story and see where you've become detached from the world and you remain a little boy finding that little boy and in him this is where the secret lies because if you try to make yourself more responsible or a man there's nothing wrong with that but part of you that little boy always going to be divorced and he will be the one that trips you up when you don't want it because he's looking for that pleasure he's looking to live in an epic life where things are exciting and that's nothing wrong with that Every boy is like this, but this boy should have grown up with, yes, life is epic, life is exciting. Now, let me father you, let me initiate you into the tribe, into the world of men, to show you how to actually live that life, instead of being slave to every impulse that comes, every feeling that comes. So, uh, what would you say to somebody who doesn't know about that inner boy? They haven't, they're not aware of there being an inner boy. Hmm. Well, it's time to start looking for him. The longer you live it for, the harder it becomes to find him. And before you know it, you'll be a middle-aged or an advanced-aged man and you will or, not have any joy, any joy left to live for. So how do you begin looking for him? In your own story, in your own childhood, by taking an honest look, instead of saying, well, I've had an okay childhood, my father was okay which is what I've done for a long time. No, my father was good. He's the greatest man alive. That's what I used to say. So sitting in men's group, when people talk honestly in raw experience about their father, their failures, the good side, the bad side, I was thinking, I don't belong here. You guys didn't have fathers. Your fathers failed you, clearly. My father didn't, which in many ways, practically, he, he provided for me, he protected me. But unless I, I had started to face the ways in which he did fail me, his emotional detachment and the coldness and the harshness, and how I've dealt with that, how I became shut down and as a result of that, I would not have been here now. Taking an honest look, what's missing in you? What was missing in your childhood? Where is that little child? Why is he no longer feeling that joy? Why, is, why does he not feel like a man? Why does he not feel confident, naturally, without having to make yourself? Why do you no longer have creativity? Why do you no longer enjoy art? Because most people, everyone, when they grew up, they had this sense of beauty, of transcendence. And most of us lose it. And that's where the boy is. You lose the boy, you lose everything good that comes with him. So, um, yeah. Now let's move on to page 12. Harry's talking about becoming a father 
earlier than most of his peers. So basically him and his wife had a child way, way too early in comparison to the world in the early 20s. So he said, I don't regret any of it. But then he goes on to say, I loved my wife and I loved our son. Together, the two of them made my world make sense. My life without them was unimaginable. I knew I was a lucky man, but I couldn't, I couldn't help it. I just couldn't help it. Lately, I found myself wondering when I had stopped being young. And then he says this out loud to his wife. I just really hate the way that life starts to contract as you get older. The way your options narrow. Wow. How sad. But that's exactly how most of us feel. I've always felt this way for decades. The first time I remember feeling this way is, uh, it's funny enough, it's that same girlfriend who gave me the book. <laughs> she was my first serious girlfriend and I loved her. I felt love. Whatever love meant then. <laughs> I don't think it was love at all, but that's another... It was something complicated. Yeah, yeah, very <laughs> complex and very complicated. So we were together for a long time and we had been together since I was 17. So we were together for four years, mm, going yeah, up to five. That is a long time. That's huge. That age, yeah. And I felt trapped. Even though I lost her, I'm thinking, I'm missing out on life. Mm. I'm still young, exactly like Harry. I don't want to stop being young. Mm. I wish I'd met her when I was in my 30s. So, I mean, back then I was seeing 30s as something way, way too far in the distance. So, so you're equating being young as not being committed. Yes, experiencing the fullness of life. And then, as you get older, things get greyer and more dull and more boring and more just, just an endless life of duty and chores. And Because, uh, let's face it, growing up in Bulgaria, you know, post-communist Bulgaria, you don't have much positive thought about the future and about, well, the older you get, the more responsible. But the word responsibility, mm. even in this society, has been taken out of out of context because it just means ability to respond to life ability not having to make yourself do things that well you know life is horrible but i guess i have to live i have to be to get it done no you shouldn't be this way it shouldn't be that hard all the time yeah it's tough but you need to have a sense of inner life when that boy is alive then you have the strength of a man combined with the life of the boy then you can overcome then you can be a good father you can be present but because the boy is not there he wants his life, and the man is thinking, whoa, I should really be more responsible. There's always going to be that divorce. And so many good men mm -hmm. today just trying to do the right thing, but not living out of this inner sense of life. And then you look at this young girl next to you and think, you know what, I deserve some pleasure. And it's sad what happens, but that's what Harry did. Mm. So uh, you're equating um, being young with not having to be responsible. Well, I did. Yeah. You did. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Because responsibility for me just meant loss of life. Yeah. Loss of everything that made me feel alive. Loss of the beauty, loss of the search, the exploration, even the danger of, you know, being into life, being into the pleasures of life, right or wrong. However, you know, they wherever they sit on the moral sort of spectrum, once you lose that sense of excitement and that adventure, for me it was a slow death. Don't you think that, you know, when Harry was saying, well, at least say something about life contract, your life options yeah. narrow as you get older. But as you commit to a life's path, um, you know, let's suppose, for example, you decide to study, you decide you want to go into medicine, you decide you're going to be a doctor, then all of those decisions um, play their part in deciding on what your life's journey is going to be like. It doesn't mean to say you won't have any options later on, but those early decisions are bound to play their part, aren't they? Absolutely, yeah. So, you, But you can't go through life without making any decisions. No, but I think what Harry relates to is what most people struggle with today, that choices are made for them. Oh. Very few of us actually follow our calling because we don't know what calling is. Oh. Again, getting hold of that boy, restoring, you, you know, walk in the journey of restoration so you do you, sorry do you mean that we are kind of forced to make decisions before we're ready um or in some way we should have been ready before before we were forced to make the decisions <laughs> we should have been yeah. Yeah. we should have been grown up we should have been whole yeah, exactly we should if you grow up as a 
as a boy who's become a man but didn't lose that boy and yet didn't compromise on his ability to be strong and, and, and tough and reliable and committed. So imagine growing up like this, you have a sense of calling and look at the great men of history, they've all had it. That's what made him great. They, they, didn't, they were not just stuck in childhood, just trying, oh, well, the good old days, I wish I was young again. No, they were strong men, um, but they had an inner sense of wonder and of destiny. And Winston Churchill comes to mind because he writes and talks a, a lot about this destiny and, and, and almost values that people say, oh, well, that's gone now, get on with life. Just, just work, with, work with Hitler, work with the Nazis, just keep the peace. It's about surviving. And he said, no, I'm born to make the, my mark on the world. He never lost that. And that's why he's great. That's why so many people like him. And if, if we all had that inner sense of wonder and joy that boy preserved when we entered manhood, then we'll challenge the system, but also change it for the better, not just re rebel and all become hippies. <laughs> and not having to work or you know <laughs> I just have a vision of Winston Churchill being a hippie it doesn't quite fit <laughs> it doesn't know <laughs> so you enter the world and you say well you need to get a job what job what am I good at well I guess the closest I can get to is this or that so it's just option for the second third fifth best but you're not fully alive and that's where the trouble mm. is mm. I think so is there an easy route to becoming fully alive no <laughs> no there's no such thing as you know and you've you supported me on my you mentored me on my walk for 10 years and i'm and i'm still on this journey of of healing of discovering who i really am as a man because it's, it's the opposite of what i always thought about myself yeah if you told me that one day i'll be working with men and and doing even even like a podcast man, that's crazy I never mm -hmm. felt being a man anyway. I never felt I was a man. I always knew that I was not, I was young. I always knew that I didn't fit in the man's world. But now I found out it's quite the opposite. I didn't fit, there was a reason for that. There were many reasons. But I could actually get unstuck from all that and move into the world of, of power, of influence, of impact. By power, I don't mean power in the sense of people might see it, but I mean ability to impact people, influence. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, it's a tough journey, but it's well worth it. Yeah. So the beginning to, to becoming whole it is starting the journey, finding a way to start the journey yeah. to wholeness. Mm. Now, we're getting to the part where Harry Silver is actually cheating on his wife. He actually does it. And it's literally, I think, on his birthday or a day after his 30th birthday. So... That's where he feels the lowest about becoming 30. And that's, where, that's when he's presented with, with a temptation. Is this young girl at his office. And he drives her home and then she invites him in and he goes. But there's a struggle, as always. There's a struggle to do the right thing. And he says this when he's making that choice. He says, go home. A voice inside me said, decline with a polite smile and go home now. And he says this, and maybe I would have. If I hadn't liked her so much, maybe I would have. If it hadn't been such a rough night, maybe I would have. If I wasn't coming up to 30, maybe I would have. If her legs had been a couple of inches shorter. <laughs> <laughs> so, comment on that. Carry a ruler with you <laughs> to measure leg length. <laughs> um, I think he's just making excuses. They're all excuses, aren't they? You're very harsh on him. Uh... <laughs> but isn't, there, isn't that interesting when he said, maybe I would have if it hadn't been such a rough night. Because with me in my journey, you know, I used to, as you know, I used to be addicted to sex and pornography uh, even before I knew what addiction was. But later when I was married, you know, things get harder. And I found that things were the hardest after having a rough day. Or a rough night. You argue with your wife and then you feel like... Because you need some sort of comfort, you mean. Yes. Yeah. And again, it's the boy. Yeah. Because if that boy has been brought out, out of himself, from his father and other men around his father, you know, the tribe or the village, the elders, whatever you want to call it, then he would have known how to deal with hardship. He would have 
not felt, I need some external comfort. I need yeah. that. But because you're so young inside, you need it. You can, and you can see with men in power, so many of us are still just, just big babies, basically. It doesn't make sense what we do because our choices no. are dictated by that inner boy, that inner me. Yeah. And we're not whole. So long as we're not whole, yeah. these things will work against us. Yeah. Right. Let's move on to page 43. Now, it's the night. They slept together. And this is the next morning. And he says this. He, he sort of remembers. He meditates on what he's done. And he says, the reason that most men stray is opportunity. And the joy of meaningless sex should never be underestimated. And then a couple of lines down, he says, what I liked least about it was that already I was starting to feel like a traitor. And then, just to comment on that, the reason that most men stray is opportunity. I found that very interesting because it's easy to judge people. I've seen that with some people, especially people who try to make, who are on the journey of becoming a moral man instead of being whole. There's a difference between mm. morality and being whole. Huge mm. difference. Mm. And that's what put, puts people off from just being a good man because you're just trying to make yourself into something that you, you're not, you don't feel. And many men like that will just teach other men and just say, you know, you just need to you, you stay away from sexual temptation. But how many of those men actually have this temptation available to them? Many of them, it actually hasn't been available. So it's almost like you're bitter with men who have it and you try to stop them. So he said, most men stray because they have the opportunity. And I'm not sure if I agree, but it's worth thinking about because, yeah, it's easy to be a moral man when you actually don't, have any opportunity not to be immoral. And I, I, use, I really use this in my work um, in terms of aggression because I, I use this quote from Nietzsche and he said, I've often laughed at, at the weaklings who think themselves good because they have no clothes. Again, when it comes to male aggression, it's easy to be a good man or a nice man when you don't actually have anything in yourself that makes you be bad. But when you have power made available to you, when you feel powerful and strong, and you can retaliate, you, you, have, you have the options to be something beside being good, then is the real test of character. Then you can fully be called good because you're actually whole. You have power to do good and bad, and you're choosing good. That's a good man. That's a whole man. People who have, haven't got the opportunity, then you can't judge them as to how good they are. We just, we just don't know, do we? No, no, there is some truth in that. He doesn't seem to, in everything he said so far about um, cheating on his wife, he hasn't said anything yet about not wanting to hurt her. You know, because the, the effect of cheating is that you're going to cause hurt. Um, Has not said that? Isn't that something which would stop most people, most men, even though they have, they might have the opportunity... Uh, do you think most men don't think about the consequences of cheating? The consequences of their uh, promises to be faithful and the effect that being unfaithful might have on their wife? Well, it's uh, if you live life as a man who is still a boy inside, from a child, you don't expect that sense of seriousness, that, that commitment. When you're still young inside... That sense of commitment eventually runs out. And then you just want your pleasure. Child wants to play. Child wants to feel excited. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's wrong when you allow this child to... Um, rather, when you stop this child from growing up, when you don't find the resources and the help that you need to become a man before you make a commitment or, or after you've made it already. Because, again, it's that child. How much do you expect from a child? He might be the best child in the world. He's still a young boy. And eventually that young boy will show you that he's young. He has his needs. They haven't been met in childhood. Eventually that will be made manifest later in life. And everyone mm. around you will pay as we see. Mm. Now, now we get to the real stuff. <laughs> now we've dealt with the symptoms of Harris' illness, if you will. 
the units of us all to a degree. But now we're beginning to see his story and we're beginning to get some clues as to why he is who he is today. Chapter 6, page 47. He says, every father is a hero to his son, at least when they're too small to know any better. And he talks about his son and how he looks up to him and he, his son told that he was a hero. And he said this, but before they grow out of it, all sons think their dad is a hero. And then he says this, it was a bit different with me and my dad because my father really was a hero. He had a medal to prove it and everything. And he talks about his dad, said, if you saw him in his garden or in his car, you'd think that he was just another suburban dad. Yet, in a drawer of the living room of the Pebble Dash Semi, where I grew up, there was a distinguished service medal that he had won during the war. I spent my childhood pretending to be a hero. My dad was the real thing. Wow. Look at this. Already a huge sense of, no, I, can't, I don't measure up. Mm. He's a hero. I never will be. Mm. So, as, soon as, as long as you live out of this identity of I'm not as good as him, I'm not as heroic as him, I never will be, then you'll be a failure. Mm. You might be the most successful, the richest, the, the outwardly sort of fulfilled man, but you will be a failure. You will not have your father's values that should have been imparted to you. See, when you look at the gap between generations, that's one thing I want to comment on. For me, what a true progress is in terms of humanity in the world it's not just having a better mobile phone or having more luxury, more pleasure, more comfort, which is a good thing. But I think what it is, is, is having everything that good that the previous generation could offer and then adding your own blessing, adding your own goodness to it. So going back to his father, he should have had his father's strength because he's his son. Of course, he comes out of him. His father should have been able to impart into him that, that sense of you're strong. You're just as strong mm -hmm. as me. You'll be just as heroic as me. But then when you grow up in a modern world, you actually can do more things now. You can build upon that strength, mm -hmm. not only strong enough to fight a war or to fight poverty or to fight for your family in terms of providing for them and loving them, but, but also being more fulfilled in the world than his father was. So what do you think was missing um, in Harry's dad's ability to impart strength? Well, when you look at the way he grew up, he had to make himself tough. Yeah. Now that's the other, the other extreme because Harry didn't grow up in wartime. So he didn't, that sense of strength and courage and, and fighting spirit was not called upon in him. But in his father's case, mm. he had to bury that little boy with all the creativity, all mm. the goodness, all the joy, which Harry actually had. Harry was in television. He had all the creativity, all the goodness yeah. in terms of that joy. But his father had to bury that and go and fight, and go and survive, and, yeah. and after the war to provide and protect things that, you know, were, were required of him. Yeah. There's an interesting um, piece at the very beginning, I don't know whether it's the introduction or the preface, or whatever it's called, before chapter one, when Harry says this, there are many good things about my father, but he is not a soft man. He is not a sentimental man. He doesn't gurgle and coo over babies in the street. My father is a good man, but the things he has gone through in his life mean that he is also a hard man. Today, that was the day when Pat was born, I think, some deep ice inside of him begins to crack, and I can tell that he feels it too. And that um, that description um, has the sense of his father having to hide um, all kinds of things deep down inside, and only occasionally in, in his life uh, did something crack that frozen part of him inside and allow something to come out. And maybe it's that that was missing um, for Harry, that his, his dad could not impart the strength that he needed to, to yeah. his son because so much of him was frozen and hidden yeah. deep inside. Yeah. 
because me and you have both gone back very far deep back into our stories we know that how this sort of thing has affected us but when you look at yourself as a boy and sometimes they try to toughen us up before they loved us so when a child doesn't feel safe with that man that that is a hero of your life then you don't feel you belong with him he doesn't make this available he doesn't hug you he doesn't make you comfortable in the world of men which is to say your own skin later in life but so when you don't feel I belong to this man, I belong in this realm, then everything that that man does that is good and positive in terms of strength, you feel it's just not available to me because I'm not this way. Of course you're not. You're a child. I remember growing up and my dad, he never intentionally, well, at least consciously actually, did anything to diminish my manhood. But he used to say to me, oh, you know, you're a hero. You're my hero trying to instill that in me, but he, he never really touched me in terms of intimacy. So I grew up thinking, I better be that hero then. I better be like him. I used to hear stories about him being tough and then being, you know, uh, beating a bullies, whatever. And so wanting to be like him and him expecting me to be like him. And yet I knew I didn't have it. How did I know it? Because you're a child. You're not supposed to be strong and tough as a child. You're supposed to be loved as a boy. And Harry didn't have that love in terms of the physical connection thinking mm. you're my boy now later mm. later you can be toughened up but because already that boy has the layers of love the foundation of love laid down he feels safe so when that man pushes you and say come on now you can do better you feel safe with that man and you say yeah okay okay and that's this can make or break boys and very often it breaks them like in my case my father would just say you can do better come on what would you say to you know a listener or a reader of that book who never felt that their father was their hero because their father was absent. And there are many reasons why a father can be absent. Physically, or emotionally, you know, abandonment. Someone who's never had that role model of a father to say, he is my hero, and then to have all of those attached um, issues. But there's another whole experience of life if you don't have a father around. What would you say? Well, look at the men that you used to look up to when you were a boy. What sort of men were those? Superheroes. You might have to go all the way back in the very early age. Was it Superman or Batman or, in my case, was Zorro and Hoda? But what was it about them that made them your heroes? Because that shows you who you really are inside. The things that you aspire to as a young boy mm. is because you belong to that world. That's why when I looked at my father's good qualities... I blocked out everything that was bad because I wanted to hold on to my identity. No, no, he's good. Look at the way he stood up for himself when he was 20 and, you know, he was in whatever place. So I admired that because actually we're all meant, we're all born to be someone special. We all, we all have that strength. We all have everything, at least we're meant to. But then it gets taken away. It gets stolen. We were born into families who were not just imperf imperfect, but broken like severely broken damaged deprived there is no single survivor of this battle that that life is so i would say who did you want to be when you grew up that's maybe is where the your clue will be that's maybe the man that you can still be well that's a good starting point it might be helpful yeah starting point is the word yeah yeah so um, where are we now now, if we go to page 64, again, the child here manifests <laughs> because that's, his wife is now confronting him about him having cheated on her. And she said, I should have known the romantic ones are always the worst. The hearts and flowers brigade, the ones who promise never to look at another woman, always the worst because they always need that new fix, that regular shot of romance. And then Harry says, you know, I'm sorry I hurt you and all that. And she said, it can't always be a honeymoon, you know. I know, I know, Harry says. And he says this, but deep down inside, what I told was, why not? Why not? And that's exactly the thing I can relate to. That's why this book really mm -hmm. resonated with me. Because I always wanted, and still do, but now I have got an outlet. Now I know that life can be exciting. But back then, when I was not whole, when I was not on the journey being whole with where I didn't really know who I was, what I was meant to do in this life. I always just wanted life to be exciting. And I knew at some point, I knew because I was 
so ruthless and drifting and looking for pleasure and romance and all this, I knew that I would probably end up not married or just not being able to commit to the woman. And I was fine with that. I actually wanted this life because I felt that's where I fit. I fit in when I'm trying to be romantic. Like the best side of my creative side, the best side of me in terms of being beautiful inside came out when I was with a woman who was strange to me, who didn't know me very well. That's strange, isn't it? As soon as element mm. of commitment came, an element of dailiness, element of, of something that maybe... Routine. A, a routine. Then I'll just pull back. Mm. And uh, there's Harry doing exactly that. Why not? Why can't life be a honeymoon? And this longing for, for transcendence is not a bad longing, but that boy needs to be brought out. He needs to be initiated into the world of man so that you take... I mean, this beautiful line that I keep quoting, but probably never will stop, is by Coleridge. And he said, genius is carrying the feelings of childhood into the powers of manhood. Wow. Talk about people who changed the world. They had that mm. feeling of transcendence, of being romantic, being heroic, of chivalry. But then they had the power to actually be someone as men, not just stuck in childhood and just pining away about the good old days. Mm. So... He talks to his father now about his divorce. Obviously, his wife has just left. Well, it's not obvious, but it's in the book. <laughs> <laughs> and then look at how his father reacts. It just You can just see between the older generation and the... You, know, you can just see that striking difference. Walked out, my dad said angrily. What? You're getting a divorce? Is this what you mean? I hadn't really thought about that. Getting a divorce? Where do you start? Harry says to himself. And then to his father out loud, he says... I guess so. Yes, that's what people do, isn't it? When they split up. He stood up, the color draining from his face. His eyes were wet. He took off his glasses to wipe them. I couldn't stand to look at him. You've ruined my life, he said. Wow, I think that's significant. Mm -hmm. And especially when he said, I couldn't stand to look at him because... In him, in Hardy's inner nature, there's still that heroic, that boy who, who, who is meant to be a hero like his dad. And by cheating on his wife, Hardy actually cheats on himself and his dad's legacy in him. He can't stand to look at his father because he can't stand to look at that deeper, nobler part of himself. I think it might be part also uh, in part to the fact that his father is obviously hugely disappointed uh, because as a parent you invest in your child and you invest in your grandchildren you invest in the whole family and a lot of your energy your resources are committed to the family and you you have an emotional investment too in your your child your child's spouse their children and when it all falls apart, it's devastating mm. to the parent, grandparent. And yeah. where, where do you go as the parent and the grandparent? Are you supposed to let go of all of these relationships? It's terrible. Yeah. yeah. It's terrible. And the disappointment, however, I think it might be landing on his history of disappointment. Because growing up with someone you think is a hero... Yeah. They're always going to be disappointed in you for not being <laughs> like them. So, so now that's sort of the... <laughs> it's the, confirmed that he's a yeah. disappointment. <laughs> he's just a failure. <laughs> <laughs> he knows it now for sure. <laughs> he sees it in his father's eyes. The next page, he just confirms it. He says, I couldn't look at him. That's the trouble with thinking your father is a hero. Without saying a word, it can make you feel that you're eight years old again and you have just lost your first fight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that's exactly what we've been saying, isn't it? Mm. Now, if you go to page 94, his wife's left now and he ended up being a single father. But again, he doesn't know if you can handle that because he's not been made strong by the world of his father and... and and the world of man, he's not been given his masculinity by his father. He's not, this has not been released in him, in his body. That strength is saying, yes, come on, son, you can do this. If he had had that as a young boy, he would have been more up for it, more able. 
he might not have made the mistake. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And he just, <laughs> again, him and his dad, he said to his dad, I don't know if I can do it, dad. Do what? Said the father. I don't know if I can look after Pat alone. I don't know if I'm up to it. I told Jin I could do it, but I don't know if I can. <laughs> and look at the father's reaction. Harry says, he turned on me, eyes blazing, and for a moment, I thought he was going to hit me. He had never laid a finger on me in my life, but there's always the first time. <laughs> and um, there's something about a man who is comfortable with his strength and his masculinity that he's present. And let's face it, every man has every man who is who has become a man, is, at least to a degree, in terms of become more himself, the way he is really, has this, this ability to to be dangerous inside. And they're not fearful in their surroundings. They're not sitting around just trying to cope with the world. They're actually there. They're present. They make a difference for better or for worse. And his father clearly is there. And he looks, even at the age of late 60s, I think is by this time, or 70s, he looks and feels dangerous. And a little boy who has not been made part of the world of masculinity, who doesn't know that he himself is dangerous, fears that. I always fear other men. Always. Especially they are confident men. They reminded me of the world of my father. They reminded me of the world that I could never be a part of. I just knew it. So I always fear that that presence in men, which is such a part, which, which is such a surprise that actually I'm, I'm I'm helping men and becoming more present because that's where my true calling was, buried underneath that fear. So Harry just still lives in that physical fear of that masculinity that he thinks he doesn't have. What does his father say something to him? Ha! His father said, Don't know if you can do it. Don't know if you can do it. You have to do it. Mm -hmm. That's what the father says. <laughs> and it's, and Harry said, It was easy for him to say. <laughs> his youth might have been marred by the efforts of the German army to murder him. <laughs> <laughs> but at least in his day, a father's role was set in stone. He always knew exactly what was expected of him. My dad was a brilliant father, and he's the killer. He didn't even have to be there to be a brilliant father. Wait till your father get home was enough to get me to behave. <laughs> <laughs> Which I totally agree with. That element of father is still needed today. But not a father who's divorced from his boy side. Not a father who's divorced from gentle, his gentle side which clearly is the way his father has been wounded. And then he wounds his son in the, in the other way. So Harry, I, he idealizes this, this sort of time and that masculinity. And he thinks he maybe will do better then, but if he is in the state that he is at the time he speaks, then he won't. Do you, do you think um, he's intentionally bringing in the change of role of uh, fatherhood? into this. Um, this seems to reflect a little bit on the generational change between the expectations of being a man and a father that his father had. And um, he seems to be saying, well, it's very different now. In your generation, you weren't supposed to get divorced. You were supposed to be, you know, your role was set out for you. You knew what you were supposed to do. You had to go and earn the money. You had to come home and then discipline the children. But now for me and my generation, the expectations are completely different. I've got to be able to feel and I've got to be able to care for my child on my own. And you, Dad, never did that. You just went out to work. Do you think there's any of that coming in to this? Hmm. What was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> you stopped listening. <laughs> no, I was listening so intently that I forgot the beginning. <laughs> I think I have as well. Oh, yeah. Um, the, I, I was asking about, it, is he, Tony Parsons, intentional in bringing into this story the difference between um, the expectations of the role of the father in one generation compared to the younger generation? Well, yeah, I mean, what I think from Harry Silver's point of view, it's again looking outwards, looking for some something and someone to 
idealize, but also to give him an excuse, maybe. Because mm. you're thinking, oh, wow, if, if I only was born in that time, mm. I would have done better. It was easier for you. Yeah. He was it saying, wasn't easier. <laughs> he was saying, it was easy for you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But he's the one that made the mistake. Yeah. It's <laughs> a good these, excuse. These are the consequences. Yeah. You now have to look after your son. Yeah. And if his father made a mistake during that time, um, I don't know, his family would have starved. Or if he made a mistake during the war, he would never have come home to his mm. family. So mm. I think the consequences then were a lot more serious. Mm. And that's why men had to be tougher. But I think men should become tougher again. In a different, well, not in a different way, but in a way that includes their gentle side rather than exclude them, like the men of the past mm. did. Mm. So, page 110. <laughs> that's a funny story. It's an amazing story. He goes to, he goes to see his, his mom and dad and he finds out that their house has been broken into. <laughs> and his father is actually, I mean, they're two young kids. And his father's actually quoted this. He hit one of them. He punched him. And he fell to the floor. And, uh, and he got hold of the other one somehow. And he tied him on the floor. So Harry enters the living room, horrified, because he heard from the mom on the door that their house has been broken into. And Harry said, I was expecting to see my dad lying in a pool of blood. Instead, he was all smiling and, and then he led me to the living room, Harry said. He says this. At my father's feet were two youths, belly down on the carpet, with their hands tied behind their backs. <laughs> they were trying to unplug the video, the father said, when I walked in. One of them had the cheek to come at me. <laughs> He lightly prodded the thinnest, meanest looking youth with a carpet slipper. <laughs> Didn't you, old chum? <laughs> and the father then says, had to stick one on him. My father threw a beefy right hook into the air. Caught him good. <laughs> the other one tried to make a run for it, but I just got him by the scruff of the neck. The muscles, Harry says, thinking, on my father's tattooed arms rippled under his short sleeved shirt as he demonstrated his technique for getting a teenage burglar by the throat. <laughs> he had my mother's name in a heart inscribed on one arm, the winged dagger of the commanders on the other. Both tattoos were blurred with ages. Again, he looks at his father's strength. Mm. He looks at his father's tattoos. And the tattoos, they both speak of loyalty, the opposite of who Harry's become. Mm. It's almost like growing up with a father like this. You live out of an identity that I'm not like him, I never will be. And of course, we know that, that you never live past your beliefs about yourself. You never live out of something different. So one might think that maybe he subconsciously sabotaged his life because he knows that he cannot live this life. He cannot live a life of loyalty, of strength, of ability, of, of, of being, being the man like he wanted to be. Look at both tattoos, and one is about being loyal to his wife, and the other one is about loyal to his band of brothers, literally. And Harry just looks at that from outside looking in, the world of man. I can't have that. I could have never dealt with those burglars. This it's way. an amazing contrast to see his father, who was willing to have his wife's name tattooed on his arm. Uh, that's taking commitment another step, hmm. isn't it? Absolutely. And then again, Harry thinks, and he says, what would I have done if I had found these two yobs or any of the million like them in my home? Would I have had the sheer guts and the bloody-minded stupidity to take them on? Or would I have run a mile? Whatever I would have done, I knew I would not have done it with the manly certainty of my father. I couldn't have protected my home and my family in quite the same way that he had protected his home and family. I wasn't like him. But with all my heart, I want to be. Wow, what a gem here. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a struggle, isn't it? Mm. To see what you want to be, but believe you can't be it. Yeah. Um, and of course, I immediately think, listening to this today, 
you would certainly be worried about the young people carrying knives. Mm. You certainly wouldn't confront them, would you? Anyway. Mm. And yet his father, either it wasn't an issue then, it probably wasn't, um, but it wasn't something he thought about, whether I'm going to get hurt or not. It was just, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this, I'm going to sort this out, without even thinking, really. Mm. It's spontaneous. Um, ability to protect what's yours. Mm. And the whole idea of sacrifice, it was instilled in him from very early age. Yeah. And I think that's a wonderful thing, being able to leave yourself behind and sacrifice for the for those who you love. Yeah. And you're right, because those people who went through the war did that all the time, being in a dangerous situation and being willing to, to potentially sacrifice yourself for the good of somebody else or for the greater good. Mm. Um, rather than think about, well, what's going to happen to me? Am I going the Germans to get, have knives. Am I going to get hurt? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's a completely different mentality and expectation, isn't it? Mm. And if those men, they hadn't done what they had to do, then we would have been sitting and living in a different country now. Maybe we wouldn't be here. Yeah. Who knows? Again, 157. He... Very often he starts a chapter or a paragraph with, here's another difference between me and my father. <laughs> mm. Isn't that amazing? Mm. But what's great about Harry Silver and Tony Parsons, I guess, is that this is conscious. And I think what was good about my life, even though there's so much misery, I actually knew it. And most of us, we bury it deep down and we live out of this unconscious desire to prove something to our father, uh, who maybe wasn't there at all, or, or to become like him. But like Harry, I was also always conscious. I remember being involved with drugs, um, like sitting in a room full of cocaine. And I'm thinking, if the police come in now, I would be a huge disappointment to my dad because he was very upright. He is still. Man, what is he going to say about this? What would he do? And I remember this always running in my mind, always. And, and Harry is absolutely the same. And he says... Um, Another difference between me and my old man. Prior to this, his son has had fallen into an empty swimming pool and hit his head quite badly. Then they, you know, had some stitches, so he was fine. But then they go back to recover the bike. The bike that actually was the reason for his son to get hurt. Harry says this. After Pat fell into the empty swimming pool, I would have been quite happy never to set eyes on his bicycle again. But during one of those endless hours at the hospital, my dad drove to the park and recovered the bicycle. Hmm. Wow, here's another lesson from his dad. The bike was exactly where we had left it, undamaged apart from a bent handlebar. I would have cheerfully stuck it on the nearest skip. My dad wanted Pat to ride it again. I didn't argue with him. I thought I would leave Pat to do that. So he, all, he thought that his son was like him, <laughs> feeling so weak and not as adequate to be like like that heroic man, that he wouldn't want to challenge himself. But actually, boys can tell us a lot more about the true nature of man than grown men can. Yet, Harry says, when my father took the bicycle from the boot of his car, my son seemed happy to see it. <laughs> I straightened the handlebar, my dad told us. It needs a lick of paint, that's all. Shouldn't take a minute. I can do it for you if you like. My dad knew that I hadn't held a paintbrush since I had dropped out of all level art. <laughs> so they go out and they get the bike ready. One more thing, my father said, producing a small silver spanner from his car coat. I think it's time that a big boy like Pat took the stabilizers off his bike. Just to comment on that. Wow. Not only did it hurt himself, mm -hmm. not only did the old man was not going to allow this to stop his grandson, but he mm. actually showed him how able he is to face another challenge. Mm. You're, you're not hurt. You're not less than what you could be before. Mm. And I'll show you that by raising the standard even more and you'll be fine. Mm. So uh, his grandson probably had more of a connection with the world of masculinity at this mm. point than Harry did. Definitely. Mm. And because let's not forget at this point, the old man is softer now. He's able to love a lot more. Mm. His defenses are a lot kind of down a lot more. And Harry says this. This was my old man at 70. Tough, 
kind, confident, grinning at his grandson with boundless tenderness. Wow, I would comment that Harry never had that. <laughs> this boundless tenderness. Mm. He had expectations. And, and yet I found myself railing against his DIY competence, his manly efficiency, his absolute certainty that he could bend the world to his will. And I was sick of the sight of that bite. <laughs> mm. Mm. Very interesting. It's interesting to see the skip of generation here, that his, his dad was able to provide something for the grandson where he wasn't able to do it for Harry. Mm. We don't know all that detail, but it's interesting to, to observe the difference. Mm. You're right. And again, he compares himself. The thing is, at this point, when you're in your 30s, if you, if you don't deal with that stuff, they grow inside of you. So I remember going back to, to Bulgaria and just sitting next to my dad and being so irritated with him because there were some things that he was, I felt he was withholding from me. Some sort of intimacy and like having a drink together and he won't be interested sometimes. And I'm thinking, why? Uh, now I don't. I've dealt with that father wound. But because Harry hasn't, he still, everything that happens between them, instead of getting the good out of it and saying, wow, my dad is actually help, helping my son to, to, to be confident, something which I can't do. Mm. Instead of being thankful for his father, he's resentful because he can't be that man. And he compares himself. And he says, the burst boiler, the knack guttering, the hole in the roof, no task was too big or too difficult for his immaculately kept toolbox, meaning his father's. He loved my wife's praise when the job was completed, but he would have done it anyway. My father was what my mother would call good around the house. <laughs> I was exactly the opposite, he said. I was what we call, I think, useless around the house. <laughs> <laughs> it's just classic. Mm, isn't it? Why don't you say something about, um, you mentioned the father wound in what you just said, and there may be somebody listening who, who hasn't heard that phrase before. How would you describe that very quickly and simply? I'm very hesitant to that because there's such a huge area that we need to do not a podcast on this, but maybe a series of podcasts mm. and, and, and videos and books on this, and we'll still be scratching the surface. But if someone would say to you, what do you mean by father wound? I mean, how would you answer that simply? Well, I would bring them back into the realization that a boy is meant to feel one with his father. Whether we like this or not, whether we acknowledge this or not, or we realize it, a boy wants to belong to his father's world. If he doesn't have a father, he has this longing that, and the longing itself proves that he wants to belong to the world of man because he's a boy. He's a man, future man. And this is, this is everything that he starts the life with. And men are not perfect and fathers are not perfect. Sometimes they're not even there. So every result of that luck or abuse or any negative part of a father-son relationship produce what people call the father wound. Mm. A wound coming from the father. Yes. Essentially. Soul wound and mind wound and, yeah. and psyche wound mm. inside of you. Coming from a father or, or coming from the lack of a father. Yeah. I think it's a lot, a lot to do with luck nowadays because fathers are just leaving. In the past, maybe uh, it's different from the lack, emotional lack, because mm. they were there physically. But it's even more frustrating because my father was there physically. Mm. So I ended up idolizing him and not dealing with any father wound because I never knew it was there. Mm. I said, no, no, he never left me, so he must be okay. Not knowing that I, I, I had deeper needs than just him being there physically. Mm. And not to mention people who grow up with fathers who are abusive and mm. harsh and, and some horrific mm. dark things that can happen to children. Mm. So the father wound is the result of all that damage, which we all suffer, because no father is perfect, no man is perfect. So would you say everybody carries father wound? Absolutely, 100%. Okay, we move on to page 234. They're going to an event now, Harry is going to an event, and he needs to dress up nicely. And he says this, Black tie, it said on the invitation, and I always felt excited when I had to dig out my dinner jacket, dress shirt and black bow tie, a proper bow tie that you had to spend ages doing yourself. I could remember my old man wearing black tie once, once a year, for his company's 
annual dinner and dance at some fancy hotel on Park Lane. There was something about the tailored formality of a tuxedo that suited his stocky, muscular frame. My mom always looked slightly amused by whatever bow gown she had climbed into that year, but my old man was born to wear black tie. Well, said Sally, shyly grinning up at me through a curtain of hair, you look just like a bouncer outside a, like, really, really cool club. No, Pat said, pointing his index finger at me and cocking his thumb. You look like James Bond, licensed to shoot all the bad people. But as I stood in front of the whole mirror, I knew what I really looked like in a dinner jacket. More and more, I looked like my father. Wow, that's so poignant, isn't it? Mm. You see, the men that some of us spend lifetime trying to become like, we actually are like. Mm. And if some emotional thing has not been made available to us, it's not too late. Because if your father was strong, chances are that you're strong. It's not just a chance, it's a guarantee. But it was brought out of your father, and it can be, bring, it can be brought out of you as well. Maybe even in a more genuine way. Because now you don't have to sacrifice the little boy that, that you already have. Now, more and more men are talking about becoming emotionally available, and that comes from the little boy. If he's free, he would want to touch your spouse. He would want to play with children. He would want to be creative and express your emotions, not suppress them. But now, if you can get the strength back, which you regretted for not having, then you'll be complete, a whole man. And that's what I've, you know, what I've committed my life to, because that's life. Mm. Now... Harry's father is actually dying. He's had cancer for a while, but he's never told them. So when they finally start to see the symptoms, he had lung cancer, they send him to a doctor. But what they didn't know for a long time is that he actually knew. And he hadn't told them. So Harry and his mom are trying to work out why hasn't he told them. And they wonder. And he's asking his mom, why has he never said anything about this? And then after, after some time, his mother says this, he was protecting us, she said. My mother took his hands in her hand, there in the hospital, and held them to her cheek, and I looked away, fearing that I might unravel at the sight of how much she still loved him. Protecting us, she repeated. That's right, mom. He was shielding us from the worst this world has to offer. He was sparing his family some of the misery that was ahead. He was protecting us. He was doing what he had always done. And that's another thing about the quote-unquote old-school toughness is it protects. True masculinity protects. Mm. Nice. I was just thinking of the, the whole process of being willing to step up to be the protector uh, as part of your role as being a man and whether Harry in reflecting on this you know seeing his dad protecting them while he was dying uh, whether or not he felt he didn't succeed in protecting Pat from that fall on the bike for example and whether if he'd been fully present I can't remember what he was doing in the story. Reading something? I, I can't remember now, yeah. No. But it reminds me of um, fathers that I observe these days sort of abdicating and not being fully present. Mm. You know, being on their phones um, or reading a newspaper or watching television, you know, trying to have their own time mm. rather than stepping up and being fully present so that they can protect. Um, yeah. Um, Imagine wanting your own time when the Germans are shooting at you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where's me time? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I think a child mm. does that. Because we haven't grown up, if we like Harry. Um, you always want me time. I always wanted me time. Always. For me, my but whole life was about me. In my generation, the whole phrase me time didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a new thing. Your yeah. generation have created that need. Yeah, we are ah, <laughs> reaping the consequences. 
Now we go back to page 294. They've just left the hospital, Harry and his mom, because it's late at night. And he's holding his father's medal in his hand. And he's, he's thinking about his own life, of course. See, when you don't know that you're good enough, when you don't know that, that you will ever be as good as you want to be, you're always focusing on yourself rather than the world and your work and your, your family and your place in the world. And uh, that's what happened to me when I was a boy. You know, I never knew that if my dad had told me or if other men had told me, I would have been able to play football like they did. Because I didn't, I hid and I always, it was about me. Oh, why can't I do this? Why? And when you look at other children played football or swam or whatever, they didn't care about themselves. See, it's the whole principle of losing your life so that you can live. They just, just, just went ahead and they had fun. But because I knew that I couldn't, it was all about me. So self, a lot of selfishness comes out of, out of this deeper, almost like being a cripple in the world of men, not as good as them. And again, he compares his dying father to himself and he talks about his generation. But he's onto something here because he said, As my mom went off to put the kettle on, I had a medal in my fist and I thought about how the games I had played as a boy had prepared me to be the man my father had been. And the man his father had been before him, a fighting man, a man who kissed some tearful woman goodbye and put on a uniform and went to war. Looking back on the games we had played in the fields and the back streets of my childhood, they seemed to be more than childish pastimes loading the manly virtues. They seemed to be preparing us for the next war, for our own Normandy or Dunkirk. My generation had played games with toy guns, or sticks pretending to be guns, or fingers. And nobody had thought that it was unhealthy or distasteful. But the only wars we saw as young men were small wars, television wars, as real and as life-threatening to the non-combatants as a video game. My generation, the last of the generation of small boys who played with toy guns, were luckier than we knew. We didn't have a war waiting for us when we grew up. There were no Germans or Japanese for us to fight. Our wives, that's who we fought with, this generation of men blessed with peace. And the divorce courts, that's where we fought our own grubby little wars. I think Harry's on to something because he's right that a man is called to a battle. Everything, as you know very well, worth holding on to in life or building, like a family or relationship or connection or, or business or company, you have to fight for. You have to endure to some hardship. You have to push yourself and, and become tougher. So he's right that these games prepare you to become the man that you're destined to be. But he's also right that it's a tragedy to waste this fighting spirit uh, in fights with your wife, in, mm. in fighting who's going to keep the children. Mm. Yeah, it's very sad and poignant that all that energy is used for that, when there are far greater things to fight for. I mean, instead of fighting for your children... For rights for your children over the divorce, you could be fighting for your marriage. Mm. All that energy could have been put into the relationship, and it is true for marriage. You know, you have to fight for it if you want it. Mm. If you want your marriage to last, you have to fight for it. Mm. Sometimes even with your own self. Yeah. <laughs> so to go to page three hundred and three, they're going to see the body now, the body of his father. His father's dead by this time. His father's passed on. Seagulls. Well, live by the sea, you get seagulls. They're beautiful, actually. I, I find them beautiful because I was not brought up here. I was not born. People here hate them, but I actually love them. It's part of life, being by the sea. So anyway, Harry is going to see his father's body and he's hesitating. It's his final meeting between his father and him. How would I feel, he said, when I saw the man who gave me life lying his, his, in his coffin? Would I unravel? Could I stand the sight of my great protector waiting for his grave? I couldn't stop myself believing that it would be too much, that I would crumble and come apart, that the years would be wiped away and I would be a sobbing child once more. That's a very powerful descriptor of your emotions. Mm. or potentially mm. um, what happens when you 
go to see the body of a loved one. I've never done that. Have you ever done that? Well, my grandfather when I was um, mm. in my teens. And, and, and a few more distant relatives, yeah. Both of my grandfathers, actually. Mm. Oh, yeah. We, because of our tragic history, we become, mm. we, we have this weird obsession with death. And especially the countryside where I come from, the rural mm. community, we revel in it. It's like, mm. it's almost sick. Everything is open coffin and everything is it's exposed to the brutality of death. Almost like to prove to ourselves, yes, life is tragic. Yes, that's why life, we're not doing it. That's why we're superstitious. That's why we've not done well. Yes, it's, uh, mm. it's but I think this is different here because that's the father who gave him identity. That's the father. Mm. I mean, one thing I should say about the father-son relationship and the father wound. It doesn't matter how old you are or young you are. Your life gravitates around your father. People say, no, no, no. How is that? Well, people who have devoted their lives to becoming the opposite of their abusive fathers, some, a lot of that mm. energy is actually coming out of the father wound. Of course it is. So, yeah. so long as you're operating from sickness, yeah. not health, you will not be fully alive. Yeah. That's why so many successful people wake up in the night fearful, feeling, am I doing enough? Am I going to fail? Because they're not rooted deeply in the identity of their own being, their own masculinity. They've not made peace. They've not embraced their masculine heritage. They've not dealt with the father wound. So, of course, you feel unstable. And people like I used to be who idolize their father, they now waste their lives, like Harry, just comparing yourself. Mm. Again, you gravitate around your father. You're You're not your own man. And so they had this special relationship, which is in many ways deluded as most of the important relationship of humanity because humanity is so complex, so broken, so good in many ways, so it's complex. But that's why he's just fearful of him becoming a child. Uh, Complex and also it seems that either for good or bad you can't escape the effect of your father on your life. Mm. Yeah. There's no escape. I don't think we should want to escape. But unfortunately, the world is so broken that a lot of what our fathers have given us is is, is bad or it's not there. But not, not perfect, anyway. Oh yeah, far from perfect, because no human being is. But I think we should be hanging like John, our mutual friend John Richard. He, what did he do? Some something with the Zulus in in South Africa, didn't he? Mm. And he he when he came back, he told the story of how the Zulus they saw that every man is a a link in a chain, in a chain of, his ans- of his male ancestors, of his yeah. tribe, of our fathers, grandfathers. Yeah. So you're not floating in there, you're hanging on them. Yeah. So whatever they gave you, good or, or bad, if it's bad, underneath there's something good. And masculine heritage, no matter how absent the father was, or, or if he wasn't there, you can go deep into yourself and your own history and discover bits that are good, embrace them, so that you're not floating in the air, you're actually hanging on that chain. Mm. What do you do if it's all bad, though? If you try to reject any influence from your father because you see it as all bad, uh, is that detrimental to you? Absolutely. Finding your own masculinity? Mm. What, why is that? Because even if it was all bad, if your father was the worst possible influence, um, he wasn't never meant to be. There was, when he was a boy, he wasn't. Something happened to him to cover up the goodness. And that's his, I'm not excusing him of responsibility. Of course he is. Mm. But our responsibility is to find what our father could have been, what our father deeply was as a young boy, and embrace that. And we can find that in going back, asking family members, in going back deeper into ourselves, or in looking at our own children and grandchildren, thinking, what have they got from their grandpa that, that, that might be from him that is good? And reading and going to the photos, talking to family members, just finding... Okay, if my father wasn't such a, you know, so-and-so, whatever, mm, what natural gifts and abilities and, and blessings he had that he could have passed down to me if he wasn't that way? Because the goodness is there. What, what do we miss out on if we find that too difficult, if we reject everything our father was? Well, unfortunately, the saddest thing that I have to say is that we miss out on part of ourselves. And this is so serious and so true. Like for my part, look at my dad the way he was, st- strong, tough, he would wake up in the morning and go. He doesn't, he doesn't like, if you woke him up and say, let's go to work or let's go to war or let's go to, to do something, he wouldn't need to have breakfast, he wouldn't need to have coffee, 
he never drank any coffee. He would need to make himself comfortable. He would need to meditate in the morning <laughs> or do his stretching as I do, which is not a bad thing. <laughs> um, he gets up and goes. Mm. So I rejected that subconsciously. Mm. And I grew up someone who loved books, stories, music, pleasure, just the opposite of him. But what I missed, I'm like, you have to drag me out of bed in the 12 o'clock. Like, I'm so lazy, so lazy. The only physical effortful thing that I did was going to the gym and keep my body strong because I was a perfectionist. I wanted to, to look a certain way and be strong. But everything else to do with effort, I rejected. So are you a get up or go person now? Absolutely. But it took me 10 years, mm-hmm. walk into the dark. And I'll never forget the moment, because I suffered with depression for, for a long time, even though I didn't have a label for it. Thank God I didn't. Mm-hmm. So when I started coming out to accessing my feelings and expressing and trying to connect with my masculine heritage from my father in my body, I started to become alive again. And I started to be able to do the things that my father would have done. Mm-hmm. Wake up in the morning and go. And But I had to put, as you know, I had to put myself through a lot of hardship and I suffered a lot just to get to that point. And that's good. Mm-hmm. That's, you need to get that training into manhood. And I discovered traits about my father that I didn't know, that even he doesn't know he had. And, because he's not into that deep stuff. He's from a different generation, a different culture and whatnot. And I'm still hoping I'll be able to talk to him, of course, but I discovered things about himself through, and his, his own father that I'm now embracing. I want them. I want mm-hmm. what they've already given me in my body. Mm-hmm. You see, it's incredible how how... If we reject something we think is external, like the heritage of our father, parts of ourselves are, are not alive. That's why so many people who are quote-unquote tough have sons like Harry Silver. Good men, but just weaker and softer and just not able to raise up to challenges and to overcome and to be strong. It's funny, isn't it? Mm-hmm. How that works. So Harry Silver, by rejecting his father's heritage, of course, he's right to reject the bad, but, not, but by not dealing with the bad and embracing the good, he's deprived himself subconsciously from a whole world of being, a life of being, a life of strength, never feeling like I don't measure up. So I think, you know, every father gave blessing to his child, even if he was a mass murderer. There is something in that man that is good because he was not born to be an evil guy or absent or whatever. And that's worth discovering, rediscovering, dealing with the painful heritage, dealing with the shadows, getting to the light and, and owning it. Mm. Now, regarding that same thing, heritage we go to, to page 320 where it's the funeral of his father and 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 harry remembers how everyone around him cried and the uncles and the aunts and people who are older he he said they were crying for my dad but also maybe for themselves because they see the end of the life that they had and he said this but i stood there dry-eyed as i watched them lower my father's coffin into the freshly dug grave one arm wrapped tightly around my mother who had her own arms around her sobbing grandson, and my free hand stuffed deep into the pocket of my black suit, my fist holding my father's silver medal as though I would never let it go. That's significant. And that's why I wanted to, to make peace with my... I wanted to deal with my father wound. That's why I went to all the retreats, to the boot camps, to the counseling, to the men's group. That's why you came into my life and I, and I sort of opened up to you because... I didn't want one day my father to die and for me feeling all these feelings like, oh, who is this man anyway? I spent my life worshipping him and I've been fooling myself. Who is this man? And he's holding on to his father's medal because deep down, this medal belongs to him. If you're a son of someone who's exhibited some, some heroism, some goodness, you are his son for a reason. You've got this. You've got the medal inside of you, but you need to bring it out even though your father couldn't help you. Life is not over yet. You could be that man. You could embrace the heritage of that man. Mm. I think now we're coming to a close where we can just have a have a have a few comments on that. Obviously, we're not going through the whole book. We're not doing a book review, as I said. Mm. But I just wanted to highlight some points of that book because there's so much about masculinity there. What do you take away with yourself after reading it? I think the overwhelming thing is a kind of feeling of sadness for Harry that he continually seems to miss the point. Um, And you could say, well, 
in the book, he's being described as a person who, who's never been reconciled with his younger self. And that's the reason why his story is so sad, because it's just a life full of um, mistakes and regrets. And there doesn't seem to be very much sort of contentment and happiness in it. Um, and I wonder whether there is a path to contentment and happiness. What would you say? Absolutely. Yeah. That's why we're doing this podcast. So what is the path <laughs> to contentment and happiness? Because it'd be so nice if it were possible to, you know, look back and summarise your life as one not like Harry's, which is, I, I, I don't mean uh, a life which doesn't have continual challenges or difficulties, because every life does, but one which seems to be more satisfying and not so kind of full of angst and uh, regret. Um, all of the time. One where the challenges are outside of you and you're inside your hole and have to face them and fight for others rather than just struggling inside yourself, you mean? Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's, it's a deeper journey. It's the... It is a deeper journey, one that Harry hasn't been on. No, clearly not. Yeah. yeah. Bless him. That's why I, I called my work Life Training for Men because men need to be trained when they were little, but when we're not, we end up like Harry, parts of us are split and divided, or we end up like his father, just being tough and strong, but mm. not being able to feel much. Mm. So he's either one way or another, or an amalgam of both, but when we take men through the life training, we actually reconcile them with the, the lost parts of, of, of their own selves, so that they can become whole. If they didn't have strength, we reconcile them with the parts that, that are able to be strong. If they didn't have any creativity or any joy, any ability to be childlike, we bring them back into those parts who have been buried for some reason. There's always a reason. And I think that's the answer to Harry's life. What would you say to someone who wanted to start on the path to becoming whole? I would just say, there is a reason why you feel the way you feel. I like that phrase, there's a reason why you feel the way you feel. Mm. And mm. it is the quest to find out why. Yeah. What is the reason? And things don't have to stay the same. Because mm. people now take their whole personality and their outlook on life as granted. Well, I am a more melancholic. I am more of that, you know. Mm. No, you're not. You're not. You were born to be a full, rounded up, a whole man. It's just that this world is broken. There's something uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson said. I'll, I'll paraphrase, but he said, the world is broken up and lies in broken heaps because man is divided within himself. See, we seek for a lifetime trying to, find, trying to find peace, but we're trying to fix it on the outside, don't we? We need this shot of, of happiness, shot of romance, shot of success and money. I say, look into yourself, and then the outward reality will start shifting. Who, who said uh, recently, you can't change the world, but you can change yourself? Probably Jordan Peterson, someone like that. Sounds like him, doesn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, that's... Things can shift inside. And you don't need to be of certain age or certain backgrounds because the biggest change, as you know, that we've both gone through, I've been in my late 20s and and mid and, uh, and early 30s, and you have been... When? How old? Um, Your well, deepest, deepest change. It, that started in my early 50s. There you go. And continues now in my late 60s. There you go. It doesn't matter how old or... or, or. I would like to say, though, the, the sooner the better. <laughs> the earlier, the easier. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. For everyone. Yeah. So here's, here's to hold then. Mm. Yeah. Well, thanks for this, Keith. Yeah, thank you, George. Thank you. We had a good time. Mm. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Speak to you soon. Bye.